Welcome to the Eiffel Tower, one of the world's most recognizable landmarks and a symbol of French ingenuity. Erected in 1889 as the centerpiece of the Exposition Universelle, or World's Fair, it was initially criticized as an eyesore. Despite its detractors, the Eiffel Tower has stood tall for over 130 years and succeeded in capturing the hearts and imaginations of millions of visitors from around the world. Come along as we delve into the fascinating history, design, and construction of this iconic monument. From its humble beginnings as a temporary structure, to its status as one of the world's most popular tourist destinations, the Eiffel Tower has endured as a testament to human ambition and creativity. So, let's take a closer look and discover what makes this engineering marvel, truly one of a kind. The year was 1886, and a World's Fair had been scheduled to take place in Paris three years later, in 1889. It was intended to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the French Revolution, and the organizers wanted to do something big. Very big indeed. A competition was announced for someone to build a tower. Something with a square base, 125 meters wide and 300 meters high. In 1886, a height of 300 meters would make it taller than any man-made structure on Earth. This competition was an opportunity for the Eiffel Company, founded by engineer Alexandre Gustave Eiffel. At the time, the company specialized in building bridges, but Eiffel had recently supervised the construction of another iconic monument, the Statue of Liberty. Two of his engineers, Emile Nouguier and Maurice Keclar, drew up the initial designs. They imagined a tower with four latticed feet, spread apart at the base and joined at the top like a pylon, and linked together by metal beams arranged at regular intervals. Architect Stephen Sovest reworked the design, making it a bit more ornate, and it was this revised design that received the seal of approval from Eiffel. He submitted the team's design to the competition, where it was selected from a pool of more than 100 other entries as the winner. With a design selected, there was no time to lose. The ambitious structure needed to be completed in just over two years, in order to be ready for the World's Fair in May of 1889. On January 26, 1887, they broke ground on the project, but its construction would be plagued with difficulties. Not long after construction began, a letter signed by famous artists and writers was published, protesting. They argued that the tower was a monstrosity and an eyesore that would mar the beautiful Parisian skyline. The letter read in part, We, writers, painters, sculptors, architects and passionate devotees of the hitherto untouched beauty of Paris, protest with all our strength, with all our indignation in the name of slighted French taste, against the erection of this useless and monstrous Eiffel Tower. To bring our arguments home, imagine for a moment a giddy, ridiculous tower, dominating Paris like a gigantic black smokestack. All of our humiliated monuments will disappear in this ghastly dream. And for twenty years, we shall see stretching like a blot of ink the hateful shadow of the hateful column of bolted sheet metal. The mention of twenty years is because the Eiffel Tower was originally intended to be a temporary structure. To stand for twenty years and then be disassembled. Eiffel, however, did not back down and responded to the criticism by comparing his tower to the Egyptian pyramids. My tower will be the tallest edifice ever erected by man, he said. Will it not also be grandiose in its way? And why would something admirable in Egypt become hideous and ridiculous in Paris? Others complained that it was a waste of money and resources. This opposition had little effect on the construction of the tower, which was after all, already started. The reality of building such a massive structure in such a short time was much more challenging. Gustav Eiffel employed a team of up to 300 workers, many of whom were skilled metalworkers and engineers, to build the tower. They would build it using iron, not steel. Iron was strong and durable, and Eiffel was familiar with it from his work building bridges. Each leg of the tower would rest on four concrete slabs. Laying the slabs for the east and south legs, was simple. The foundations for the west and north legs proved to be more difficult. They were closer to the river Seine, where the ground was softer. Each slab on those sides had to be supported by two concrete piles driven to a depth of 22 meters. Once all the slabs were in place, they were each capped by a block of limestone with an inclined top, 
that held a supporting shoe for the ironwork. The foundations were completed on June 30, and the construction of the ironwork began. The framework of the tower rose incredibly quickly, thanks to prefabrication in Eiffel's workshops that had been going on in the six months that it took to complete the foundations. More than 18,000 different parts were needed, and the drawing office made thousands of detailed drawings, allowing them to plan each one. The drawings were complicated by the complex angles involved in the design and the degree of precision required. For example, the position of rivet holes had to be specified to within one millimeter. Some sections of the tower were assembled in the factory, and then transported by horse-drawn car to the construction site to be bolted together into even larger pieces. If any part did not fit, it was sent back to the factory for alteration, as no drilling or shaping was done on site. During construction, the bolts would be replaced by rivets. A total of 2.5 million of them. Safety, both of the tower itself, and of the workers who were building it, was a primary concern. Eiffel, familiar with the stresses faced by bridges, had mathematically calculated a curve, to offer the best wind resistance. As he said, all the cutting force of the wind passes into the interior of the leading edge uprights. Worker safety was a high priority as well. A major objection to the construction of the tower was that it would be impossible to create without sacrificing the lives of many workers, due to the heights at which they would be working. Eiffel, determined to avoid deaths and injuries among his workers, implemented a series of safety measures designed to prevent them. Wooden platforms with high edges were built wherever possible, both to prevent workers from falling, and, almost as important, prevent tools from falling onto others working below. Guardrails were also put in place. Although the safety measures were basic compared to modern standards, they were considered quite progressive at the time. Due to the care taken to prevent accidents, only one death was associated with the tower's construction. To build the tower, the workers first constructed four enormous legs, each made up of large pieces of iron that were bolted together. The legs were then joined together at the first platform, which was located around 57 meters above the ground. From there, workers began to build the central section of the tower, which tapered inwards as it rose towards the top. As the tower rose higher, the difficulty of raising the pieces into place increased. The builders were forced to implement innovative construction techniques. Mobile cranes were mounted to rails that would later support the lifts and specially designed hoists were used to transport materials up to the higher levels of the tower. Another key innovation used during the construction of the tower was the use of movable scaffolding that could be raised or lowered as needed. This scaffolding was essential for the construction of the tower's intricate latticework design, which required workers to be able to access every part of the structure. With the challenges of construction well in hand, there was just the little matter to consider of how visitors were expected to view the tower. While some people might climb the stairs to the first platform, it was unlikely that many would be willing to climb to the top. Instead, a series of lifts would be installed to carry passengers up the edifice. At the time, elevators were a cutting-edge piece of equipment. The first electric elevator had only been built a few years before, in 1880, and hardly any buildings in the world had them. The question of how they could be incorporated into a massive 300-meter tower was not simple. Rather than installing electric lifts, Eiffel decided to use hydraulics. The first level lifts were relatively straightforward to construct. The legs of the tower were wide enough to contain a straight track. Two lifts were installed in the east and west legs using chains with articulated links, and lead weights counterbalanced most of the car's weight. However, installing lifts to the second level proved to be more challenging, as a straight track was impossible. Eventually, the contract to build them was awarded to Otis, in July of 1887. They designed a lift with two compartments, each holding 25 passengers, and an inclined hydraulic ram to provide the motive power. The lift operator occupied an exterior platform on the first level, and the hydraulic pressure was produced by a large open reservoir on the second. The journey between the second and third levels required yet another kind of lift and French engineer Léon Edou was commissioned to design it. He came up with a unique solution involving a pair of hydraulic rams mounted on the second level. 
One lift car was mounted on top of these rams, and cables ran from the top of this car up to sheaves on the third level and back down to a second car. Each car, which weighed 10 tons and held 65 passengers, traveled only half the distance between the second and third levels. Passengers were required to change lifts halfway by means of a short gangway. This lift system was a marvel of engineering in its own right. As the tower began to take shape, it became a symbol of France's engineering prowess and technological advancement, and some people who had previously objected began to come around. As construction pushed higher and higher, new challenges appeared. High winds made working at the top of the tower difficult and dangerous, and workers also had to contend with extreme temperatures during the summer and winter months. Despite these difficulties, construction of the tower continued at a record breaking pace. As 1889 dawned, the workers raced to finish the tower in time for the World's Fair. By March, main construction of the tower was completed, and the French flag was hoisted to the top of the tower to celebrate. Over the following weeks, final touches were made to the tower, including the installation of the lifts and the painting of the structure in its iconic reddish-brown color. In the end, the Eiffel Tower took just over two years to build, being completed in two years, two months, and five days. Its construction was a triumph of engineering, innovation, and perseverance. Fully finished, the Eiffel Tower stood at a height of 300 meters, making it the tallest structure in the world at the time, a record it would hold for 41 years. The tower was officially dedicated on March 31, 1889, in a ceremony conducted by Gustave Eiffel and the French Prime Minister, Pierre Tirard. The Eiffel Tower was the centerpiece of the World's Fair, which began on May 6, 1889, but it also served as the entrance. Millions of people visited the fair, nearly two million of which came to see the tower. That's 12,000 people a day. Visitors to the fair were awestruck by the tower's sheer size and elegance. The tallest structure in the world, it rose to dizzying heights. The iron in the tower alone weighed 7,300 tons. With the addition of the lifts, shops, and antennae that were installed later, it is estimated that the current weight of the Eiffel Tower is 10,000 tons or more. The tower's intricate lattice design was also a source of wonder and admiration, with many people marveling at the engineering and artistic skill required to create such a magnificent monument. The tower was also lit up with 10,000 gaslights, and spotlights were placed at the ground to illuminate it further. A beacon was placed at the top as well, ensuring that the tower stood out from its surroundings, day or night. Although the tower was finished for the opening of the fair, the lifts were not operational for almost three more weeks. In that time, over 30,000 visitors made the trek to the top on foot, climbing more than 1,700 stairs to reach it. In a time before aeroplanes, the top of the tower offered an unprecedented view of Paris from above. The tower immediately became a global sensation, capturing the imaginations of people around the world. By the time the World's Fair closed on October 31, 1889, it was clear that the Eiffel Tower had been an unqualified success. Despite this victory, Gustave Eiffel was faced with a new problem. The land the tower was standing on had only been leased for 20 years. Unless he could find a strong enough argument to leave the tower intact, his crowning achievement, the tower that bore his name, could be dismantled as early as 1910. Eiffel immediately began investigating possible scientific uses for the tower. As wireless telegraphy technology began to emerge in the 1890s, he saw an opportunity to use the Eiffel Tower as a transmitter and receiver for radio communications. In 1898, Eugène Ducreté established the very first radio contact in Morse code between the Eiffel Tower and the Pantheon, four kilometers away. A transmitting station was then installed permanently on the tower, and in 1899 it enabled radio transmissions with London. Military authorities became interested in the emerging radio technology, and tasked Engineering Corps Captain Gustave Ferrier to conduct experiments. Ferrier set up shop at the foot of the South Pillar with a small team of specialists. In 1903 he perfected receiving devices, and Eiffel financed the installation of an antenna at the tower summit. In the following years, Ferrier established communication with eastern forts 400 kilometers away, and a naval base in Tunisia. 
he even reached out to a distance of 6,000 kilometers in 1908. In 1909, a permanent station was built, and the tower's strategic importance was confirmed. As a result, Gustav Eiffel's tower was granted an extension for another 70 years, starting on January 1, 1910. During the First World War, the Eiffel Tower Communication Center allowed the French army to communicate with their allies. It also played a crucial role in intercepting German messages. Many German messages were intercepted from the tower summit, and in March 1918, a coded radiogram was intercepted which allowed the French to thwart a German attack. This helped turn the tide of the war, leading to a final victory. After this, the tower's strategic importance was unquestionable, but people still searched for more creative uses for it. In 1921, the Eiffel Tower began to be used to make radio broadcasts. It was later used as a billboard, with advertisements on three of the sides. Beginning in 1935, the tower was used to broadcast short-range television signals. When German forces occupied Paris during World War II, the French cut the cables to the lifts to prevent the Germans from using it as an observation post. From 1940 until the lifts were repaired in 1946, the tower was closed to the public. By 1964, the Eiffel Tower was officially declared a historical monument, and was considered a symbol of Paris and France. The tower has undergone multiple renovations and upgrades to meet the needs of modern-day visitors, but its iconic design and structure remain unchanged. The entire tower has to be repainted about every seven years. The original lifts have been replaced with more modern versions, and the gas lamps that originally lit the Eiffel Tower have been replaced by electric lights. Today, the Eiffel Tower attracts millions of visitors each year, and is said to be the most visited tourist attraction in the world. The tower is open to the public, and visitors can ascend to the first, second, and third floors for breathtaking views of the city. The first platform has a glass floor, allowing visitors to look down at the ground 57 meters below. The second floor has a large outdoor observation deck, while the third floor features an indoor observation deck, a champagne bar, and Gustav Eiffel's original office, which has been restored to its 1899 appearance. The Eiffel Tower is also an important site for cultural and artistic events. It is frequently illuminated at night with different colored lights to mark special occasions and has served as a backdrop for fireworks displays, concerts, and other performances. In addition to its tourist and cultural functions, the Eiffel Tower also plays a key role in the city's infrastructure. It serves as a crucial antenna for radio and television broadcasting, and also functions as a support for scientific research instruments and weather monitoring equipment. The Eiffel Tower stands as a testament to the ingenuity and perseverance of the human spirit, and continues to inspire awe and wonder in people from all over the world. The construction of the Eiffel Tower was a massive undertaking, and a test of skill, that required the cooperation of hundreds of workers and engineers. To this day, the Eiffel Tower remains one of the most recognizable and impressive engineering feats in the world. Its design and construction was a major accomplishment in its time, and its continued success as a tourist destination and icon of France is a testament to its lasting legacy. The Eiffel Tower has come to represent not just Paris, but France as a whole, and its iconic silhouette can be seen in countless images and postcards around the world. Beyond its role as a symbol of national identity, the tower has played a role in shaping the city of Paris and even the way we understand and experience technology and architecture. From the part it played in the development of radio and telecommunications, to its service as a transmitter, it paved the way for future advancements in wireless technology. The tower's height made it a popular spot for early aerial photography, allowing photographers to capture panoramic views of the city from a new perspective. The Eiffel Tower has also served as a canvas for a number of notable works of public art and illumination. Over the years, the tower has been lit up in a variety of colors to commemorate special events, creating a breathtaking spectacle that can be seen from miles away. Finally, the Eiffel Tower remains a beloved tourist destination drawing millions of visitors each year who come to experience its breathtaking views, marvel at its engineering, and revel in its historical significance. Whether you're a Parisian or a tourist, 
The Eiffel Tower is an unforgettable symbol of the city, and a testament to the enduring power of human creativity and innovation. Standing tall at the heart of Paris for more than a century, it has been an inspiration to millions of people around the world. As we continue to look towards the future, the Eiffel Tower remains a timeless monument that will continue to inspire and captivate us. For generations to come. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe to my channel so that you won't miss a thing. There's more fascinating content coming your way, all the time. Thank you.